All right, we're buffering up to YouTube. So um, thank you again, everyone, for being at the Dismantle Preservation on Conference this year. I really appreciate you all attending this free event. Um, it's free thanks to the support of the Alpha Wood Foundation, Eileen and Norman Tyler, and Museum Hack. And while the event is free, we're encouraging participants to support the nonprofits and the charities and the causes that they're learning about in the presentations, either by following on social media or donating if you're able to. And we've also identified five different nonprofits and fundraisers for you to support as well. Um, these are Latinos and Heritage Conservation, Asian and Pacific Islander Americans and Historic Preservation, the Decay Devils, House of Tulip, and the Apache Passion Project. So um, please support all of these groups in whatever way you can. It's really important that we um, use our energy and resources to support the organizations that are changing the shape of the preservation movement. Um, so I'm gonna pass the mic. We're gonna start with Jennifer and then move on to Emily. These are gonna be back-to-back -back presentations followed by a Q&A. Feel free to share your thoughts and questions in the chat or the Q&A box. And if you're using social media, feel free to share your takeaways with hashtag Dismantle Preservation. So take it away, Jennifer. Thanks for the introduction, Sarah. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen just a moment. Um, a brief introduction of who I am. My name is Jennifer Blanks. I'm a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University. I'm pursuing a doctoral, a doctoral degree in urban and regional sciences, and my dissertation is at the intersection of preservation planning, um, disaster management, and black geographies in um, black cemeteries throughout the state of Texas. Um, and I will be presenting a paper I published earlier this year with my co-chair and two of my colleagues in my department. And the name of our paper is Preservation at the Intersections, Patterns of Disproportionate Multi-Hazards Risk and Vulnerability in Louisiana's Historic African-American Cemeteries. Also, until recent years, cultural resources such as cemeteries have rarely been the focus of environmental justice struggles. Um, and in historic preservation. And the cultural resource is simply um, evidence, physical evidence or remains, ruins um, of a site that proved a community once existed in this place. Um, and so in black communities, those, tip those features typically look like cemeteries, schoolhouses, churches, um, sometimes even bodies of water. Um, so those examples of cultural resources are historically significant and are extremely central to African-American identity um, and showing how we are able to be, or we're able to be resilient um, in establishing our communities following the emancipation, um, considering the lack of resources and where we were able to acquire land. Um, and also cultural resources serve as a historical timeline. Um, and they also help, um, help us develop our morals as a group of people and also um, practice various burial practices and traditions. Um, and this picture is just the landscape of one of the cemeteries in our study site that I'll get into in its proximity to the chemical plants. Um, so I can talk about the landscape of the study site in this paper that we talked about. Um, so one of the study sites is Ascension Parish. Um, Ascension Parish is located in the chemical corridor between um, New Orleans and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's also known as Cancer Alley um, in Ascension Parish. Uh, in 2018, um, during a, a, a land survey with private archaeologists hired by Shell Oil Refinery, um, the archaeologists uncovered the burial grounds of formerly enslaved persons um, during that cultural resource survey. And the name of that plantation of where, where it's located is Burslai Cemetery. Um, and it's, this cemetery is located near more than one chemical plant, and so it really raised the question of, one, what other burial grounds do we not know about in, um, in these areas, but also how many are they in proximity to, um, in relationship to chemical plants, but also multi-hazards um, being floodplains and, um, also, and also uh, its proximity to chemical pollutants and emissions. Um, and so descendants are able to access this memorial, but only by appointment. But we also found that the reoccurring pattern in St. James Parish as well, which is 
the parish south of Ascension Parish. Um, and parish is the same as county, it's just Louisiana, they're known as parishes, um, but it's the same concept as a county. Um, but in St. James Parish, the descendants there in um, nonprofit organizations such as Rise St. James and the Louisiana Bucket Brigade um, are currently struggling um, against the expansion of the Formosa plant, although in recent news, um, they were able to uh, win that battle and stop the expansion of that chemical plant to preserve the burial grounds located near the chemical plant. Um, but say all that to say, these two nonprofit organizations um, found a land use plan uh, from their local parish, which basically sacrificed their burial grounds for the expansion of this chemical plant. Um, and they were not included in this uh, land survey or land use designation um, process. And so uh, this caused the two organizations to rally around themselves and bring attention to this issue. Um, so I had us wondering, you know, what is the state of the erasure of these cultural resources in St. James and Ascension Parish? Um, because historically, these communities have experienced a number of issues and multi hazards because of its geographic location and then the social implications of the communities who are in Cancer Alley. Um, they've experienced uh, high flooding, you know, they have experience with hurricanes, um, they have experience with increased air pollution and um, in an, an alarmingly high. Um, chemical uh, cancer diagnosis uh, amongst the population. And so um, we were wondering what are, how do the multi hazards surrounding these cultural resources impact, um, disproportionately impact the black burial grounds compared to non-black burial grounds. Um, and for sake of defining what a multi hazard is, um, that, that's inclusive of environmental pollution. So the emissions from the chemical plants um, the erection of the chemical plant and the expansion of it and uh, accessibility to the burial ground, but also that environmental natural disaster lens such as flooding um, is frequent uh, occurrence with tropical storms and hurricanes in that corridor. Um, and again, these are all of these pictures in this presentation are from the study site um, that we that we are studying uh, referencing in the study. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, the purpose of the study is to determine if Black cemeteries are disproportionately exposed to multi-hazards um, as the impacts of consequences from flood risk, but then also the expansion of chemical plants or existence of chemical plants. Um, yeah, this is just a snapshot of the one of the burial grounds in Ascension Parish. As you can see, it's located pretty much in the middle of um, a mobile home park, but it's also in close proximity to a train train track here, as you can see. Um, and it was just really interesting the contrast between Ascension and St. James Parish because Ascension Parish is more developed. Um, there's a higher population, whereas St. James is more of a rural population. Um, and typically, these cemetery black cemeteries are known to be um, located in rural areas, kind of off the grid, so to speak. Um, they can be located in the, at the corner of a busy intersection with a lot of traffic, so it makes them vulnerable in that sense of there's no physical barrier or security um, to protect it from any uh, traffic incidents that can happen. Um, they tend to be located near churches, on the edge of former plantations. Um, so all of this is going into consideration as we are creating the database for this um, study. And so... Um, I am a part of the Texas Freedom Colleagues Project, and we rely on crowdsourced information and really integrating that local knowledge and intangible heritage um, as an official source that can and really should be used in the urban planning process. And so um, to create our database, um, we've quickly found that there is no central database of uh, cemeteries in Louisiana that's an official source, an official could be a government um, funded source, whether it's at the state or local or federal level. So we relied on um, crowdsourced databases, Ancestry and Find a Grave. And then we also found another crowdsourced database that lists all of the cemeteries, um, known cemeteries in UA in Louisiana for every parish. And so we went through the database um, and we were able to identify the demographic of the burial grounds, um, which we, we grouped into five categories, Black, White, Mixed, Jewish, and then Unknown. Um, 
And so some identifying characteristics to help us through that process um, are just some cultural signifiers such as the language of the cemetery name. So if it explicitly says the word Negro or black, um, typically portraits on headstones, as you see here, portraits are really help us identify the demographic of the individuals, um, nicknames such as Madeir, Big Mama, Greek letter organizations that are found on headstones, all of those cultural signifiers were used to help us identify the demographic of the burial ground. <clears throat> but then we also wanted to spatialize this information. So um, we created a couple of different multi-hazard maps and that include the cemetery location, its flood exposure, according to the national flood hazard layer um, for both of the parishes, which is provided by FEMA. But then we also had the location of the industrial facilities and their proximity to the burial grounds. Um, and just to quickly go over what the database looked like in numbers, um, we found that a total of 32 black cemeteries in Ascension Parish are located in the 100 year and 500 year um, floodplain designation. And then 20 of those um, are in St. James, 20 black cemeteries in St. James Parish. Um, and so this is a, one of the maps that we created um, that shows the black alone population and the white alone population. Um, as you can see, St. James Parish um, doesn't really have a high black population. Um, although it does have several, uh, it has an extensive history of plantations being in the area. Um, and then Ascension Parish is where most of the black population is located. Uh, but we can see in St. James Parish that a lot of the uh, population is white, but there are also a high number of like burial grounds there. And so some future research there, um, one I, I would think is who, who are the cemetery stewards, um, you know, maintaining these burial grounds if they are not living there, if it doesn't reflect in the demographics. Um, and as we can see, there are a few numbers. There were there were two black cemeteries in Ascension Parish that were within uh, one chemical plant and then two chemical plant. Um, and then this is what the final map looks like with all of the multi-hazard layers. <clears throat> we have the 100-year floodplain, the 500-year floodplain, um, and then the industrial chemical plants. And so we really hope that um, you know, this project can one, reinforce the, the value and significance of local knowledge and crowdsourced databases and how it can inform um, local urban planners, planners at the local municipal level. Um, but again, also looking at the disaster lens and really helping mitigate these cemeteries um, prior to a disaster <clears throat> because Louisiana, Southeast Louisiana does have a pretty extensive history of of um, some of flooding, excessive flooding and burial grounds, which actually exhume coffins um, and displace individuals. Um, but it also should serve as a yardstick for a more just and legal land use policy process um, at the lo local municipal level and really being inclusive of all populations and not um, dismissing non-Eurocentric features, memorials, historic sites in the urban planning process. Um, and yeah, I, I really think it, it's a really good uh, jumping ground for urban planners to uh, integrate historic preservation surveying and mapping into their risk assessments um, during those cultural resource surveys. Um, and this is an example of uh, a disaster management planning tool. So this is a rapid cemetery assessment uh, survey form, which was created by the National Park Service. And it's a pretty quick and easy cemetery assessment form that's downloadable. Um, so it's just one example and tool of how, uh, of what local municipals and cemetery stewards can use and incorporate in their cemetery mitigation planning. And that is my presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. And if there's any way you could share the link for that uh, assessment tool, that'd be awesome. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll share the link for that and for the paper. Thank you. And Emily, take it away. Thank you, and thank you to Jennifer for a great presentation. Good afternoon, my name is Emily Khan. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm calling in from the unceded Wampanoag land in Massachusetts. Today, I will be presenting my work I completed for my master's thesis in, in historic preservation. And sorry, we're having a screen share issue. Okay. There we go. So my master's thesis at Columbia University looked at reimagining Holocaust commemoration and is largely based on oral histories. The 
main question I ask in my thesis is how can we commemorate the Holocaust in ways that celebrate the lives of survivors and refugees in the United States as seen in these photos, in addition to memorializing the deaths of victims in Europe? Before I get into this question, I want to take a moment to explain some of the terminology I use. The terminology of the Holocaust is highly contested, and there is no singular definition of which people classify as victims, survivors, or refugees. My definitions are primarily based on how my oral history narrators identify. So I classify a Holocaust refugee as a person who was displaced, uprooted, or rendered stateless as a result of persecution by the Nazis and their allies between 1933 and 1941. A Holocaust survivor is then any person who survived direct physical persecution in ghettos, concentration camps, or hiding due to the policies of the Nazis and their allies between 1941 and 45. Both refugees and survivors could be non-Jews, but my research looks specifically at Jewish refugees. All this said, placing too much emphasis on the difference between a Holocaust refugee and survivor ultimately is a moot point. To paraphrase my narrator, Richard Datner, you either survived or you were dead. Overemphasizing de definitions also ignores the fact that survivor or refugee was just one aspect of individuals' complex identities and that these people did so much more than survive. I hope to commemorate the life experiences of Holocaust refugees and survivors and therefore stressing any one definition too heavily, too heavily would be counterintuitive. My theory has been if a person identifies as a Holocaust survivor, then they are a Holocaust survivor. I will now ask you to consider what comes to mind when you think of tangible Holocaust commemoration. While we cannot verbally interact, I'm going to presume that many of you are thinking of museums, concentration camps that are open to visitation, markers and plaques, or maybe some of the formal memorial statues or installations. You might even think of cemeteries. All these types of commemoration are critical in warning against the horrors of genocide, honoring victims, encouraging tolerance, and combating anti-Semitism. Yet they tell an incomplete story. They seek to memorialize or honor the memory and death of a person or group of people or recognize the event that led to these deaths. They succumb to the major criticism of Holocaust commemoration that has existed since the 1990s reducing Jews to victims. This is not enough when the aftermath of the Holocaust is a story of perseverance and cultural resiliency. In contrast to the thousands of Holocaust memorials worldwide, there have been almost no efforts to collectively and publicly commemorate Holocaust survivors or refugees. A notable exception is the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum, which tells the story of Jews who escaped to and forged new lives in Shanghai. To me, this museum is a monument, which I define as a form of commemoration that honors the life rather than the death of a person and or group of people. So really, I'm advocating for erecting monuments in addition to memorials, even in the context of traumatic events such as the Holocaust. So what would a monument to the Holocaust look like beyond the museum? To me, the answer is neighborhood-based and community-driven preservation, and this is where my case study of Washington Heights comes in. Washington Heights is a neighborhood in Upper Manhattan located on the traditional Lenape lands. It is most well known as the setting of Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical and now movie in the Heights. The neighborhood has been home to many immigrant communities, including Holocaust refugees. Washington Heights had one of the largest communities of Holocaust refugees in the world. And about- Emily, Emily sorry to interrupt. Is there, um, something keeps bonking your microphone. Yeah, there seems to be a lag too with my screen share. Yeah, that seems to be doing fine. There's just a, I don't know if, it sounds like paper on your microphone or something. I don't oh, know. That's odd. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right, so about 20,000 Jews, mainly from Germany, settled in this neighborhood between 1933 and 1940. And the majority of refugees in Washington Heights were not interned in concentration camps, but they were all deeply affected by the Holocaust. Refugees in Washington Heights quickly began rebuilding the culture and community they left behind in Germany. 
by forming a robust network of religious institutions and shops. And if you want to learn more about this community, I highly recommend reading Stephen Lowenstein's book, Frankfurt on the Hudson. I'm now going to share an audio clip I compiled from my oral histories. This clip will show why refugees and their children believe that Holocaust commemoration needs to evolve as well as the importance of Washington Heights. I believe my narrators truly say it best. This is an interview with Richard Dabner, Gabrielle Ross McGrockman, Frank Eisner, Rick Landman, George Daniel Frankel, Janet Byrne Eisenberg, Susan Berlin, Marion Berlin, Denise Arlen Wallen, Lucy Kikabush Steinitz, Judy Balaban, Brenda Stiefel Sherman, Karen Romano Ziegler, Evelyn Sanders, Henry M. Stern. How do you feel about existing Holocaust commemoration that's out there? I think it's a Oh, we seem to have had a glitch. Am I frozen? No. The, yeah, I don't know. It's working with the audio clip, but you're not frozen. Okay, give me one second. This is a Kikabush. picture of people. How do you feel about existing Holocaust commemoration that's out there? I think it's important. I think it's a wonderful education for others. I think they're all important. I'm just not a fan. I feel I've been there, done that. And I don't need to see yet another picture of people rounded up and put into the boxcars. I think they're important. I don't think that they need to be, they need to be, we don't need to beat people over the head with them. Whenever I encounter the Holocaust as in a museum, what happens is I get very angry at God, extremely angry at God. And that's not a place where, as a religious person, where I want to be. How do you want your story to be remembered? I want it to be uplifting. Uh, you don't have to live inside of this. I like music and I like to laugh and so forth as much as the next person. The image of, of Jewish continuity, Jewish heroism and resilience, that's rather than as, as victims and, and as emaciated and starved and tortured and beaten. It's all up here. It's probably been transferred to my wife. My, my children know about it. Do they feel it the same way I do? No. Probably not. Certainly my grandchildren won't. I think you're just dealing with the realities of this is life and the generations go on and you can, when we're gone, when my wife and I are gone, particularly me, who's, who's going to carry on the story of my family? I don't know. So Washington Heights. Washington Heights. Washington Heights. Washington Heights. The whole neighborhood was infused with a sense of humor. You could have been in Vienna, you could have been in Frankfurt, you could have been in any one of those places. Yeah, they were all very damaged people in one way or another. It was a tremendous sense of community and of wanting to maintain that, but there was always, there was always this undertow of unspoken horror that they really went through. That's where our American dream began. My mother, my parents loved living in the Heights. She never, ever wanted to leave. Even when the Heights got sketchy, she never left. What German Jewish Washington Heights was, was very particular and very wonderful in many ways and impermanent. Okay, thank you for bearing with me with some technical difficulties. So as my narrators noted, the community of Holocaust refugees in Washington Heights has largely faded, providing all the more reason for preservation. In consultation with my narrators, I've proposed a variety of preservation interventions to, to commemorate this community, such as naming streets and public spaces, 
commissioning a monument to Holocaust and other refugees and a historic district. This district would include an architecturally intact section of Washington Heights that maintained prominent refugee institutions and apartments where they lived. And these sites were mainly identified by narrators. And I've shared the link to the story map of this district with Sarah. The goal of these interventions would be to provide a more complete story of the Holocaust, to move beyond victimology and Holocaust commemoration, to show immigrants and refugees, to show the influence of refugees and immigrants in our society and how they enhance our society, and to provide a form of Holocaust commemoration that is welcoming to those directly impacted by the Holocaust. So commemoration that produces pride for those, in, for those affected instead of additional trauma. So in conclusion, I hope that Washington Heights can create a nation and worldwide precedent for using preservation as a monument, as opposed to a memorial to Holocaust refugees and survivors. The Holocaust cannot be uplifting, but how we commemorate it can demonstrate a more uplifting story of how Jews not only survived, but eventually thrived and continue to do so. And this idea could ultimately be transferred to other immigrant communities in Washington Heights and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Once I turned my video off, it seemed to be okay. It's totally fine. It's technology, it's a fun <laughs> adventure every time. Uh, so Jennifer and Emily, I feel like you both presented on very um, different ways we think through telling stories of people in the past, you know, preserving cemeteries where they're laid to rest in Jennifer's case and Emily, you know, like we can acknowledge that neighborhoods ebb and flow and evolve over time. So how do we tell the full history of a neighborhood, especially when like in the case um, of Washington Heights, it becomes known for a very specific thing thanks to, or a very specific type of people thanks to pop culture. Um, so as we wait for questions to trickle in, I'm wondering, you know, Emily, you've explored some different ways that we can tell the full story through passive interpretation and through designation. Um, for you, how has it been like engaging with the um, elders who still live in the community? You know, are these things that they're excited about? Um, have other organizations who are doing preservation work in the community reached out to them yet? Or are you just kind of blazing this path? So there have been individual scholars and artists who have engaged with this community in the past, such as Stephen Lowenstein, there is a songwriter named Allison Loeb who is leading this walking tour with music about the community. And this was based in oral histories, but the preservation community has really never engaged with the Holocaust refugee community at all. Their voice has not been heard in how their community should be preserved. So I'm trying to create a platform for them to be able to say what they think is important to their community and to have them help shape this district, which I've received a lot of support for from them and have started talking to some of the major preservation organizations in New York City regarding the comment about what to do in a neighborhood when it's known for something else. I think we've really been capitalizing off of Lin-Manuel Miranda's great work. He's telling an immigrant story, we're telling an immigrant story and they are linked together. And Everyone is excited about Washington Heights and we're hoping that they can learn more about this community as well. And I will be releasing a blog post in the coming months about this topic. Wonderful. And a similar question to you, Jennifer, have you seen existing organizations in Louisiana trying to proactively preserve African-American cemeteries? Or is this a newer initiative? Um, or is it really um, based on the descendants of the individuals who've been laid to rest there? Yeah, so I find um, one, yes, there are organizations. Um, two, two that we cited in the paper, um, Rise St. James and then the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. Although those organizations um, developed and identified themselves, came around themselves on environmental issues. Um, they're expanding their agendas to be inclusive of 
uh, those cultural resources like cemeteries and churches. Um, but I can say, you know, through tech, throughout Texas, where I'm, where I am now, and then in Louisiana, as I connect with friends on Instagram in North Carolina, just everywhere, um, it seems that cemetery preservation is best when everybody is involved and by everybody i mean the cemetery stewards especially the descendants um of the living descendants of those who are interned in the burial grounds um especially in rural areas um where you don't know exactly where the cemetery is located you really have to rely on that local knowledge and storytelling to locate a burial ground um but there's also I, I can just cite some some scholars who have been doing this work too. Um, so one obviously is my co-chair, Dr. Andrea Roberts. Not only does she um, she doesn't specifically investigate cemeteries, but it's about that intangible heritage in archives, grassroots archives, and um, the information that's embedded um, that can be found in this, like obituaries, um, high school yearbooks, church programs, um, even church records. Um, can really be helpful in that cemetery preservation process. Um, Catherine McKittrick, she's really, she's a brilliant scholar in Black geographies. Um, Camilla Hawthorne, um, those are just some of the leading um, scholars I like to cite and reference uh, in this, in this uh, Black geographies room, especially. Sounds like we need to read the footnotes of your uh, paper. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's a question from Corey for both of you. How many people do you spe each speak to? How did you choose these particular focuses and entrench in them? Um, I like to say I fell into cemetery preservation. My background is environmental science, and I think that's obvious with the disaster lens that I bring into the picture. Um, but also being from New Orleans, and how we celebrate deaths and how we spend time in cemeteries and celebrate in cemeteries. It wasn't um, so crazy for me. I think it was it, it was just like a good accident that happened and I fell into it. Um, and as far as how many people I talked to, well, um, we're starting to do more field work now. And by we, I mean the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. Um, so we've done some field surveys last weekend and we'll be going back into the field. Um, in the coming weeks, um, but on a weekly basis, I might talk to maybe two or three descendants um, of Freedom Colonies, whether it's via email or phone call, um, so yeah. Yeah, I've now talked to, I've now completed oral histories with 18 people, and I identified these individuals through reaching out to major community groups in the organization, so all of the synagogues, the senior center. And eventually I made contacts with a few people who ended up passing my information along to their friends. And I joined a Facebook page with a worldwide network of German Jews, which was quite incredible. And ultimately, since I submitted my thesis in April, I've had the chance to attend and even present at monthly meetings of this community. So people getting back together over Zoom who used to live in Washington Heights and identified as part of this Holocaust refugee community. So that's been really great. So I got into this topic mainly because as a kid, my mom would take me to talks with Holocaust survivors and she'd take me to historic sites. And I really wanted to combine these interests and I didn't see a ton of work being done here. And I happen to be German Jewish as well. So it felt great to get to work with the community and learn more about myself in this process as well. And they've been really welcoming to me too. So it's been an amazing community to work with and I hope to work with a lot more people in the future. Oh, it's wonderful. And I think there's been a common thread in a lot of the talks we've had this week, the importance of reaching out to elders and communities now and you know, there's no time like the present um, because there was a talk on Monday where they said some of the elders that they'd interviewed within the past 12 months have already passed. So we need to be proactive. Um, I am just really appreciative to both of you sharing your perspectives. 
Um, Emily, there's someone who wants you to share your thesis if you can in the chat. Um, I love that we're getting homework from both of you. That's what matters. We have websites to explore and ideas to consider. Um, whether we're navigating climate crisis or the recent past fading away with the individuals that hold those stories, these are critical issues that we need to address in the preservation movement. So thank you for giving us that food for thought and uh, everybody else who's in attendance. Um, I really hope you will stick around for the 5 p.m. Eastern talk on queer heritage. We have a wonderful lineup of panelists with backgrounds and everything from science and technology to sociology to public history and everything and beyond, but all of these different perspectives of people who are actively working to preserve America's rainbow heritage. So I hope people will stick around for that. And then we have a full lineup for tomorrow. So with over 50 presenters who are students and recent graduates and grassroots activists, this was for sure a big event this year, um, but there's food for thought in all the sessions. So thank you everyone for being here. And Emily and Jennifer, I'm just so grateful for you sharing your energy and expertise with us.